Hey everybody, I am Seth Larson. I work at Elastic as a software engineer. You can find me on Twitter and GitHub at, at Seth M. Larson. I'm gonna be talking about Python Elasticsearch client today. The Elasticsearch Python client specifically is very popular in the Python community. It draws over 100,000 downloads a day. I uh, get a lot of people coming asking questions. It's obviously very popular. And so I wanted to give this talk about just the Python Elasticsearch client and how it's built, how it works, and some things around that. So because, uh, as has been mentioned a lot of times, this is really Q&A. I really want to have lots of questions after that. I kind of wanted to prime everyone's brains before starting this talk off. So I wanted to say that the entire Python ecosystem is fair game. If I haven't heard of it, I probably should have heard of it. So I'd love it if you, you know, showed me something new today. That'd be amazing. Uh, and it doesn't have to be just strictly about Elasticsearch. Any Elastic product or service should be on the table. If you have questions about that, I probably will be able to answer them. And if not, I can kind of point you in a direction. Um, and then I have some prompts listed, just some stuff that is in the Python space that maybe you'll get your brain going for some good questions. And feel free to ask them anytime. We'll collect them up and we'll make sure that they get answered. All right. So first thing, how, if I want to use Elasticsearch with Python, how do I get the client? So it's available on the Python package index. And if you're using Conda, you can get it on CondaForge. There's those commands there. We officially support Python 2.7 and 3.4 and later with the current version of the client. And when you're using a specific version of Elasticsearch, you'll notice that there is such a thing called the Elastic Stack and that has a version associated with it. And so if you are, for example, using Elasticsearch 7, or 7.8, you can in theory use anything that is 7.8 or later for the client. So if I'm using a cluster that's 7.5, for example, I will, should be able to use, my cluster will work with any version of 7.5 or later of the client. So that's how our support matrix works. Source code is all available on GitHub. It's open source under Apache 2 license. And the docs are available on Elasticsearch Pi for read the docs. All right, so what kinds of things do people use the client for? Why don't we just write curl commands for all of our API requests? So obviously that's a, that would be a lot of work to do, but you could do it. So what are, the, what are the big pulls? So using the client, you get a lot of things kind of handled for you, or if you just configure it a certain way, it'll do a lot of work for you. Um, one of the big ones, especially if you have a cluster that is larger than a single instance, uh, there's pooling for connections, which will spread requests evenly across uh, the cluster for different coordinating nodes to not overpressure just one uh, node. You get TLS, um, stuff like verifying that your encrypted, like your data is actually encrypted and that you're talking to the cluster that you expect to. So that's a security thing. Authentication all handled for you. So if you decide to do username or password, you don't have to write that HTTP header for yourself. And then specifically for like Elastic Cloud, if you configure it a certain way, it'll configure itself properly for talking specifically to an Elastic Cloud instance. And then there's a Pythonic API, obviously. So you don't have to write all of these URLs out yourself. You can use these nice named APIs. Uh, you can use Python types. So as opposed to trying to type out, you know, all the binary that would go on the wire, you can use things like integers and lists and tuples and uh, booleans and it'll serialize all of those things properly for you. And then the client is also used as kind of like a building block for other higher level libraries. So like Elasticsearch DSL is a very popular one. Elant is a relatively new one, but it uses the client in the back end. Uh, so if you're trying to build like a higher level Python library, uh, using the client library is probably a good place to start. And then we also are very, we have very popular helpers. So like when you want to do a really specific task in Python, you want to write like a throwaway script as I'll often do with Python. You write like 10 lines of code and you kind of throw it away afterwards. So our bulk and scan helpers are really helpful when you're trying to do something like that. Like I just want to grab all the documents or I just have a whole bunch of documents. I want them to be in Elasticsearch. Those helpers will help you out with that. So how does the client work behind the scenes? So this graphic here, which I did not create, I took this from a fellow teammate. Um, one of their presentations. It's a really great graphic. 
Uh, you can see how the architecture, everything for the client is kind of split into four pieces. Uh, and all of those pieces have some interdependencies on each other. And so I'm going to go into each of these pieces and talk about kind of what their specific role is. So the API layer. So when you're interacting with this layer, you're typically interacting with this from importing Elasticsearch, that name. If you've ever used the client, that should be pretty familiar to you. Uh, this is kind of the way that almost all interactions with the library will happen through this interface. Uh, and it has all of the APIs named and some of them namespaced. So everything, the example here I gave is ES indices create. Anything about indices will be under that indices namespace. Um, and so there's different namespaces that have all their own APIs. Uh, and it'll all be Pythonic and have parameters and take a body. And what this API layer typically do just does is pass along a URL with parameters, headers, and the body to the transport layer. And then the transport layer actually handles the serialization of that. And then what ends up happening is it returns the raw response that gets taken back from transport. And that ends up being usually a JSON document. So the transport layer kind of handles taking those uh, parameters, which are a lot of times just Python objects, so like integers, they're not usually, you don't, don't typically use like binary uh, when you're using a Pythonic API. So it takes all of those different Python types and serializes them down into essentially just a binary JSON with some path like URL that you're requesting. Uh, so that's one of the primary things that it does. And then one of the other big things that uh, the transport layer does is sniffing. So if you have for example, a large cluster, but when you configure that cluster, you only hand it a single uh, host to connect to. So you say, this is an instance that I know is going to be a part of my cluster. What the transport can do if you configure it that way, it will ask the cluster, hey, what other nodes do you know about? I want to do load balancing. I want to know about these nodes. It'll get the response back and then any uh, nodes that you that it previously didn't know about it will add those to the connection pool so that the request can be spread more evenly as opposed to just hammering that one node because then that node will only be the coordinating node for all requests and that's not uh, as efficient as it could be especially if you have that multi-node cluster you're expecting more of a, uh, a horizontal scaling as opposed to just hammering that one node so the transport uh, communicates with the connection pool and asks the connection pool for connection instances, which it just immediately passes parameters to. Um, and these parameters are all the serialized parameters from, that it got from the API layer. So the connection pool, its primary responsibility is essentially holding on to connections. It's pretty much in the name. Um, what it kind of does is it has this thing called a selector, which is essentially the way that it determines which connection to hand to the transport. And so there's a few that are kind of baked in that you can use just right out of the box. So one of them is the simplest case, which is if you only have one connection, I'm only gonna hand you that one connection back. Uh, that's kind of the simple case where if you only have one instance, it'll use that connection pool. And then there's also like random. So I want a random connection and it'll just pick a random connection every single time you ask for one. And then there's round robin. So it'll make sure that the requests are sent evenly. And another responsibility of the connection pool is essentially if the transport asks for a connection, but all of the connections that we have are dead, maybe there's like network uh, issues. So like if for some reason the computer that was making these requests gets removed from the internet um, or one of those routes becomes unavailable, all of those connections won't be available currently. It'll try to resurrect connections. Essentially, it'll try to reestablish those connections and wait for that reestablishment to happen. And then once that happens, if it's successful, it'll hand back that connection. Otherwise, if no resurrection can happen, then it'll complain, raise an error that, hey, we couldn't complete that API request uh, because you're having network issues. And there's retrying that you can handle, you know, transient network issues with that as well. So then the last layer is connection. So the connection layer is essentially just wrapping a common HTTP client library, something like your lib3 or requests or AAO HTTP. Uh, one of those libraries is essentially just a wrapper around that, providing a common interface with configuration for TLS and all of those different configuration options that we offer for users. 
And this kind of handles all of the low level stuff that uh, like talking things on the wire, making TLS, verifying certificates, all that stuff. Um, and so they actually can be configured to have their own internal connection pools as well. For example, if you had a single uh, instance, but you want to be making multiple requests over, you know, maybe you have multiple API requests happening per second. And so you want to be able to get more than one result on the wire at the same time, you can have them be configured to have their own internal connection pooling. I'm going to take a, a drink really quick. So another primary responsibility of the connection is to keep these connections alive. So when you have a connection, you make a request on it, it'll try its best to keep that connection alive um, as long as the, you know, the cluster doesn't close the connection. And so if you make another request, that connection will already be ready for you. And it can, it basically reduces latency by not having to reconnect every time. That's a pretty standard feature of HTTP client libraries. All right, so let's talk about a, uh, a relatively new feature uh, that just came out in 7.8 version of the client, async IO. So if you're running on Python 3.6 and you're using uh, Elasticsearch client library 7.8.0, and this will work for any Elasticsearch 7 cluster. So this is the client library version, not the Elasticsearch cluster version. You should be able to use it on any 7x um, Elasticsearch cluster. But starting in 7.8.0 of the client, you can essentially call this additional extra, as it's called in the Python world, uh, with the square braces async. And what that will do is it'll just install AIO HTTP alongside that uh, package. And it'll make an additional uh, interface available called async Elasticsearch, which will use AIO HTTP instead of a synchronous HTTP client like your lib3 requests. And all the APIs will be uh, native coroutines, so they'll have async def as their APIs as opposed to being synchronous. And so previously there was a library called Elasticsearch async, which kind of handled this by kind of sliding underneath the API layer and saying, there's this, here's a new transport, which always gives you back uh, coroutines or futures essentially. Um, uh, it didn't play as well with some of the new async IO technology like async io.run didn't work properly, or if you define the Elasticsearch instance outside of the uh, outside of an async scope, things wouldn't work properly. So this new uh, implementation of async IO works a lot better with all of those different edge cases. So you should probably give it a try. So why should we why should we do async? Right, we already have a synchronous client. Why would you want to do async? So async. Uh, if you don't know anything about it, it essentially changes the way that concurrency is scheduled. So you, instead of having operating system scheduled concurrency with something like threads or processes, you have your program making decisions about concurrency and marking itself such that other parts of the program can collaborate with each other. So if you have two different libraries, they already know how to collaborate with each other. And so that's where the async and await keywords come in. So whenever you call await, you're essentially saying, hey, this is gonna return a coroutine. Potentially, I might block on IO. Uh, you can do other work if I end up blocking on IO. And so instead of having the operating system making context switches and stuff for you, you can kind of say, I know where I'm gonna be doing IO and I wanna do other work when I'm doing IO and then just come back to me later. But the problem happens is when you have something that's synchronous blocking IO, within an async event loop. So if I just took the synchronous Elasticsearch client and plugged it into like fast API, which is an async web framework, if I just started using it within there, I would get really terrible performance because if you use a synchronous blocking IO within your event loop, you're essentially just stopping that event loop and saying, we're not doing any more work until that IO operation is complete. And that could take you know a second. And so you're not getting any work done for a second. And that's kind of a really big bummer, especially because you know people want to use Elasticsearch from Fast API world and Starlet and you know the new Django 3.1 that just came out with async views. Um, that's you know a, a really growing uh, like section of the Python community, and so we really wanted to support them really well. And so as you can see in the example, there's the async Elasticsearch, and it has the exact same APIs. The only thing that's different is you'll have to call it with await to actually get the response. Um, and it returns back native coroutines, so they can be canceled, they can be you know, scheduled as a group or you know, awaited as a group. 
And there's also a really uh, uh, like a full example using fast API and APM on the actual project. So if you go to the Elasticsearch client library project, you'll be able to find that, that example and try that out yourself. All right, so how is the client built? So the Elasticsearch API, if you look at the whole API is really massive. And so how do we maintain that large and that complex of an API? It's 336 APIs in total as, as of today, I'm sure there's gonna be more maybe potentially by the time you watch this. But uh, so the client API, we generate almost all of the API from API specifications. So things like the name of the method, the parameters, the way that the URL is built, the method for the HTTP method, um, almost all of that is generated. And I use, at least for Python specifically, we use Jinja 2 for templating. You'll know that potentially as the templating engine for Flask. And then there's this really small project called Unasync to handle the essentially generating one API and then making it both async and synchronous at the same time, guaranteeing that those APIs are mirrored. And we use black for formatting. So you can generate some code and it doesn't have to be absolutely perfect Python code. And then you can just run black on it and then everything looks good. And you know, the changes won't be as massive. If one thing gets added, it'll know how to format it properly. And so all of the clients do this. this. A lot of this stuff can be transported across different languages. So if you were to start using Elasticsearch Ruby, you'll also find this um, generated from API specs to main sh make sure that every single client kind of has the same API and has the same features. And another part that is really great about uh, generating these Elasticsearch APIs is that we also have um, integration testing specs. And so it will essentially tell you which APIs to call with different parameters and then making sure that all of those API calls work on a live instance after you generate the client gives you a really high uh, like bar of assurance that your APIs that you just generated are proper and that they're sending the right things. And so that sort of assurance is really nice when you're generating such a large API. It's hard to, you know, imagining writing every single edge case for all 336 of those APIs is quite a lot of work. So you, you definitely get a lot by having those integration tests. Another thing about how it's built, it is, you know, the client is completely open source. I mentioned this earlier, available under Apache 2. It's all available on GitHub. And so I really encourage if you're interested uh, to download it, try modifying it yourself. You can learn things if you just want to read the code base. Um, the, the client itself is not especially um, you know, complex Python code. It's a lot of simple Python code, but it's, it's more um, learning how you can do API layering and stuff like that. There's a lot to learn there. Um, and then obviously making feature requests uh, and submitting bugs is always great. And if you want to contribute, that'd be amazing too. I always mention people, no matter how small the contribution, I always mention you in the change log. So if that uh, motivates you to make a change, so be it. All right, and then kind of the section on if, if I need help, where should I ask for help? So if you have a feature or a bug, like you know this is a bug, or you're pretty sure this is a bug, um, open a GitHub issue. Uh, I, I try to respond to those pretty quickly, especially bugs. And so opening a GitHub issue is definitely the way to go there. Uh, if you're having an issue that like isn't a bug, so something like, hey, I want to configure it for this one specific use case, or I have a question about this one parameter, it's not a bug, but I just can't figure out how to get it to work, uh, you can ask on Stack Overflow. So just make sure you use the proper tags, and there's a chance that I might find it. I do follow those tags uh, quite closely. Uh, and then if you want to talk to specifically me, you can always tag me on Twitter. I, I'm pretty active there too. Um, but then with the Stack Overflow, you might also get help from someone else. So if I'm, I'm really busy or someone might know, you know how to solve that exact problem, then you might actually get help from them as well. And if you have like a discussion or a really big idea, or if you want to just show off something really cool to me, you can always send me an email too. I, my email is public, so uh, send me an email. All right. And that's all I have. I'm now taking questions. Let's look at this stuff. So first question is, um, I know there's certain Python versions being end of life for quite some time, uh, mm -hmm. but are there some minimum requirements regarding the Python version in order to run any of those? I mean, it's pretty clear for the 8th and one, but maybe you can also mention a bit for the um, synchronous client. Yeah, so for the synchronous client specifically, at least for version seven, so major version seven, you can run with Python 2.7, 
any version of Python 2.7. Um, you know, even extremely old ones, I would recommend that you at least use like 2.7.18, I think is the latest 2.7 version. Uh, but yeah, any 2.7 version will work. Those are technically end of life, but they do work. And Python 3.4 and above. So Python 3.1, 3.2, and 3.3 aren't supported, and they probably won't work. But 3.4 and above will work because we test against all of those different versions. And then that extends off into like, you know, beta versions like Python 3.9. I do test against it. I use it locally just to make sure that things work. Um, so yeah, 3.9 should work as well. Yeah, my second question would be, you mentioned something at the beginning called Elasticsearch DSL. Maybe you can have a quick mention of what this is, what this does, and how it kind of complements the existing client. Sure. Yeah, so Elasticsearch DSL, uh, it's essentially a, if you think about like a query builder, so you can define a query in terms of objects as opposed to writing it yourself in JSON. So especially if you have like a really complex query or if you aren't certain about like the syntax right off the bat and you just want to use this object uh, building language, you can essentially grab this package, Elasticsearch DSL, and you can build a search using the, and I'm trying to remember the pattern, but it's a similar pattern to what you would do with like SQL can be, for example, where you kind of call like dot filter and then you add your filtering options and then, oh, now I want to do a dot aggregation and you add your aggregation options. And then once you're done building, you can either call to JSON and that'll serialize everything to JSON and you can hand that to the client or you can use Elasticsearch DSL's like existing way of querying and you can kind of hand that query off to a search object and you can add additional objects to that and it'll make the query for you. And then there's also another mode with Elasticsearch DSL, which kind of operates a lot more like uh, SQL can be's ORM, where you essentially define your documents that exist in an index in Elasticsearch as a class and then with attributes and everything and you kind of annotate those. And when you then go to build a query using that model, you can build it right off of that model. And then once the objects come back, it'll come back as an object that already has the same attributes as you've defined. So if you've used SQL Alchemy, you'll be very much at home with that method of uh, like configuring and using Elasticsearch. So yeah, if you're, if you're looking for more of like a high level, I don't really care about like the nitty gritty writing the, this exact like query. Um, and obviously you can do most of that. Um, but if you don't need access to like the entirety of the Elasticsearch API, if you just need for searching and indexing, then Elasticsearch DSL is a very popular way that people go. Can you talk about sending Elasticsearch requests in parallel? Let's say we want to search for keyword one, keyword two, and keyword three as a single uh, search request each, I suppose. And you don't want to wait until keyword search a keyword one search is executed before we start the second search. Like, what could we do in this situation to basically improve our search execution speed? Sure. So there are a couple of ways to do that. So if you're if these searches are happening kind of from different parts of your application, um, the Elasticsearch client is thread safe. The synchronous one is thread safe. Uh, as long as you're not like messing around with internals and stuff like that. Like making requests is thread safe. Uh, so there's that. The second option is there is an API called msearch for multi-search. Uh, so if you have like multiple different queries and you want to make them all at the same time and then get back the results kind of at the same time, you're free to do that as well. Um, and then for the async specifically, if you want to like fire off three requests and then whichever one comes back first, uh, you're fine with whichever one that comes back. Um, you can kind of fire off the request, don't call a wait, because it'll return back a coroutine, right? And then you can use either, I think it's asyncio.gather, and then pass it all of those coroutines that you just created, and it will return back the coroutines as they complete, as opposed to like waiting for them all to complete. So if you like fire off 100 requests, and then you just want whichever one, you're gonna process the results as they come back, that would be a good way to do that if you're using async. Um, and then with synchronous, you can kind of do the same thing with like a thread pool. So if you have the client and you create a thread pool that is going to call off, I think it's like map async on the thread pool. 
you can give parameters to those individual methods and it'll call it within the thread pool and then return back the results as they complete. Um, that would be kind of the way I would do it probably for the threading use case. Uh, yeah, that, that's kind of where I would take that type of problem. Yeah, one of the limitations of VM search is like you're basically putting three requests into a single request, which also means because res the request response cycle is the same, that you have to wait for all of those three requests to actually finish before Elasticsearch is able to send the whole response back to the client. So first, you have to know you're about to send three different searches and which those are. And second, you will get everything back in one big go. And that highly depends if this is okay um, for your scenario or not in, in most of the cases. Yeah, if you're sending like, like 10 requests total, one of them is gonna take forever to get back and all of the other ones are gonna be really quick, uh, you're, you'll find that the long request will make the other small requests wait. Uh, so it might be better, especially if, you have, if you're not sure about like when, how long these requests are gonna take, to probably do the method of sending them all separately and then getting the results back. But uh, it's, you can kind of experiment. Performance is all in you know, experimentation. So figure out what works for you. Are the tests a good place to find sample Python code or is there anywhere else people should look at first to basically get a grasp of the client and how it works? Yeah, so there are currently there's two examples and the documentation itself has some shorter examples. If you look at the actual uh, API uh, reference, there is a couple of examples in there just kind of like using a couple of APIs. But then if you're looking for like more substantial examples, like things using the bulk helper in this really specific way, or here's how you build a, you know, a web application and then use the Elasticsearch client. So if you go to the GitHub repo and under the, there's a folder called examples. Under that folder, there's a couple of examples there that have a lot of sample Python code that I wrote. So uh, ECS logging. So there is this thing called the Elastic Common Schema, ECS, uh, which is essentially just this schema for uh, making sure that if you are following the schema that everything within the Elastic Stack will work properly and integrate properly. Um, and so there's this library that I wrote. It's, it's a fairly small library called ECS logging. And it essentially, if you're using either the standard library logger or struct log, which is another popular logger for structured logging specifically, uh, if you're using either of those, it will automatically format your, uh, your logs to that format. And then if you are, for example, using like beats or if you're using log stash, uh, it can take those logs that got formatted and then directly put them into Elasticsearch, and if you're using something like Elastic APM, for example, you can do log correlation. Uh, so like when you have an event, it can show you all of the different logs that happened over the course of that span or that transaction, uh, which is really helpful. So that just kind of landed a couple of days ago and got submitted. So um, yeah, and so just like for services and stuff like that, it's really easy, just kind of download it, plug it in, and it just starts working. Um, there's been a couple of services that have kind of found success with that library and using breaking that into their ECS when they're migrating to ECS. So it's a good starting point. Pavel asks, can you talk about using Elasticsearch for data collection from an Oracle database? And uh, I suppose that the underlying question here is more of like how to create sort of a synchronization mechanism and how you would probably use Python for that. Or is there a more concrete question that I potentially have misunderstood there, Pavel. There might already be a connector potentially. I'm actually not sure about whether or not there's like a really nice integrated solution, but if you're going to do it from the Python space, um, typically like what people will sometimes do is they'll index maybe like a subset of their data. So they'll keep all their relational data within like their Oracle database, for example. And then all the data that pertains to what they want to be querying on, they'll add that to the Elasticsearch cluster. So that's a pretty common thing. I would say that keeping those two services separate within your service, like basically saying like, I'm going to index this data here, index this data there. There's no real like super integrated solution for that right now. Um, if you happen to be using Django, there is a thing called Django Elasticsearch DSL, which it isn't maintained by Elastic. It's a completely community 
uh, built project, but essentially hooks into the Django ORM and then listens for signals and then sends like a subset or completely those documents based on an Elasticsearch DSL model. So if you're using specifically Django, there does exist something for that. But if it's just kind of like a general, you're writing SQL or using even SQL Alchemy, uh, there's no like super integrated example. Can you share best practices for indexing binary files like PDF, MS Office documents, and Elasticsearch? Do we have a file type? I should know this. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to jump in here. Um, yeah. So what we do have is the so-called attachment processor. Yeah. And this attachment processor is a part of the so-called node ingest functionality within Elasticsearch. Um, and what you can do with this is basically that you can send a um, binary document by very likely encoding it as a base64 document, putting it into a JSON field, and then let this processor who's using, uh, which is using Apache ticker internally to extract all the metadata out of those files and then store this metadata within Elasticsearch. And usually in the best case, you get rid of this huge binary field because you can't do a lot of that with that within Elasticsearch. Um, so this way, you could do this kind of um, extraction, but it still would require to sort of configure that yourself. And the other solution to this is actually a complete solution on our side, which is called Enterprise Search, uh, where you basically have another application on top of Elasticsearch that acts as a crawler and retrieves or pulls this data automatically by just configuring it to be like, this is my Google Drive, this is my Dropbox, uh, this is my Jira, if you have it. Um, and then enterprise search goes on and pulls this data automatically, makes sure everything is updated. Um, so in that regard, that is much easier than doing it yourself, but you just pick the solution that fits you best. Is there similar functionality to Flask compared to what Django Elasticsearch DSL is doing? That's a question. No, I got yeah. It. So currently there is not because Flask, so the problem is, is Flask doesn't, have its own ORM. Usually people end up going with uh, SQ Alchemy, or I think there's another one like Poco or something like that. Um, can't remember the name because I've only used SQ Alchemy. But no, there is not a like essentially that sort of functionality for SQ Alchemy, but that idea is in my head and has been suggested to me multiple times. And so it's something that I am looking at. So if that answers your question. But I don't have any like time frames or anything like that about, about that specific functionality. No. Uh, what are some important tips in terms of scaling you would recommend for indexing and searching through billions of documents? Indexing billions of documents. Uh, well, so there is, when you're using the actual helpers, there is such a thing called uh, par like parallel bulk, which, so if, I'm not sure about billions, but what if you're, you have a really large amount of documents and you are essentially hitting like the indexing because there's only a certain amount of speed that your cluster will allow you to index at a certain amount of like times per second. Um, so what I would recommend is turning off refresh, um, using the parallel bulk. Uh, and obviously you'd want to turn off refresh in a time where you're not actively searching that, uh, that index um, or expecting those documents to be searchable right away. But if you're just doing like this huge bulk index, you probably aren't. Um, so turning off refreshing and making sure that your parallel bulk uh, has like a decent chunk size. You might want to do a little bit of like tuning, especially if this is like a one-off operation and you just want it to finish, you know, within a few days or depending on how large it is. Um, so making sure that you're tuning it properly. So pay special attention to that. So like making sure that you're maximum number of bytes per request is sent, make number of documents per request is good. Um, and then using the parallel and making sure that you allocate enough threads and resources to be able to really like get that data over the wire. Um, you can also, if you're hitting a network like barrier for that, you can turn on um, HTTP compression on your client is an option. So Elasticsearch cluster will like you'll compress your requests in addition to the responses being requests. You actually have to turn that on. Um, so if you're like hitting a network latency barrier with how large these documents are, you can do that. It'll probably save you a good amount of, uh, of bandwidth. Um, yeah. 
that would be just from a Python perspective, that's what I would look at first. Make sure that your client and your helper are tuned properly for uh, making, especially if it's like a one-off type of deal. Yeah, maybe in, in that context, you can also quickly talk a little bit about error handling. Like for example, when the cluster is overloaded and you're using our nice bulk helper, like yeah. what happens, what do you need to keep in mind as a developer using your client? Yeah, so what ends up happening with the bulk requests if a certain document fails to index, the response will return back saying, hey, this specific document didn't index. So the bulk helper, if configured to do so, will retry those documents. Um, so making sure that, especially if this is like a really long thing that you really want to work out, setting that max retries to be fairly high, because you're just like, I just want this to work. I don't, like, I don't mind if the cluster says that it's overwhelmed. That's fine, I'll slow down on my side, but I just want this to end up being a success in the end. Um, and then there's also a thing called um, like back off, it's like exponential back off. The client kind of supports this where you can configure, hey, if my cluster told me that it's overwhelmed right now, I'm going to stop sending requests for a few seconds and then try again. And then once that, like after a successful request, it'll reset everything. But if then another request fails, then it'll wait for even longer. And then this is kind of like a, a nice way to kind of get the mathematical best um, like overall throughput for your documents. Um, yeah. So I would, I would look at all of those things. Retries are really important if you're doing a really big op operation that might fail or is going to be taking a long period of time or might be subject to like network latency. Like if your network drops out for a second, you don't want your operation to fail. Um, things like that. So looking at retries and stuff like that. So. Yeah, there's also the rather recent feature uh, added to Elasticsearch called async search. Um, is this supported in the client as well? Yes. So whenever a stack release happens, we'll also like completely generate our, our new client with all the new APIs and have that released. So by the time that you can possibly get your hands on a production instance of Elasticsearch with that new version and all those new APIs, all it takes is upgrading your client and you'll have all those new APIs, the same that you'd have on the Elasticsearch cluster. So yeah, the current clients will all support async search. When I want to get a large amount of data into Elasticsearch, what is better? Oh, what is better, scan or batch-like search? So it's not getting into Elasticsearch, it's actually getting out of Elasticsearch. I misunderstood the question. Mm -hmm. uh, so we basically have a face-off here, uh, scan search, or I suppose with batch-like search, we just use changing sizes and offsets here. But if you mean something different, Christoph, uh, please feel free to correct me. Yeah, I would say the most, probably the recommended way to do it would be scan, especially if you like want to make sure that you get every single document, um, scan is the way to go. So using scroll in the background is what scan does. It essentially creates that initial search grabs that scroll ID and then uses the scroll API until things run out or you stop asking for new results. Um, yeah, I would, I would go scroll. Then you get really nice monitoring as well because then those scroll contexts will show up as well. So like if your application starts behaving improperly, it's a lot easier to kind of tie that specific scroll back to an application versus you have millions of searches happening in your logs. So that's another aspect as well. Yeah, there's one more important differentiation, uh, and that is that the classic scroll search first, it's a point in time snapshot. So it basically only takes the state of the index into account the moment you started your first search of the scroll searches, which means if someone deletes a document in between, this will not be reflected uh, in your search. And the other part is it keeps some system resources open, like file handles, because those undeleted documents still need to be searched or those potentially already deleted documents. This works for a few of those requests, like think of it as a daily full export. But if you have thousands of queries coming in at the same time, you usually try not to go with scroll search. Um, but there is a functionality called search after in the regular search request yeah. instead of specifying size and off there. And uh, this is also meant to be able to have sort of deeper pagination but not needing to use scroll search. So you're also always querying the live data set. So if you want to do that, you may want to take a look at this functionality as well. Yeah. There's also for if you're doing aggregations, especially like if you're bucketing things and you want to like 
have kind of scroll like functionality for that. You can use composite aggregations to handle that. Um, I've had to, to do that specifically for Elant because obviously when you're doing, you know, could be as large, you don't know how many buckets there are going in. So having to use that composite aggregation to make sure that you get all the buckets back is, uh, is important. So you want that same functionality for aggregations. Are there any integrations with very common frameworks? I know there's like Django being the elephant in the room. Um, is there anything else that maybe exists or any community work that's worth highlighting in that regard? Uh, well, there's another integration, which is, it kind of ties more to the Elant side um, than the like strictly Elasticsearch client side with um, Dask. So there's Dask, which is this like, essentially just you set up machines and then you have a, you build a computation, and then you execute that computation. It's not too unlike what Elant is doing uh, where you build this query and then none of the data actually lives on your machine. It's all in Elasticsearch. And then when you execute the query, it gives you back results, but like way smaller subset of results than what is actually in memory. So you can essentially work with really large data sets. Um, there's an integration that the community maintains for Dask plus Elasticsearch, which is kind of interesting that I found not too long ago, just a few weeks ago. Um, doesn't seem to be getting used a ton just because Dask is really a, kind of a newer technology. Um, but I've got a feeling that having some sort of integration with like Elant and, da and Dask um, would be great. Um, yeah, so there's something to work on there as well. What is the best approach for deleting by query followed by a bulk index? Um, because the user mentioned that sometimes there's a conflict error which gets solved by refresh. Deleting by query and then bulk index? Yeah, I, I do have an assumption here. And that is that the delete by query is triggered and it probably returns immediately, but is run in the background. And with a delete by query, you never know how long it could potentially take, right? It could maybe just delete a thousand documents or a hundred million, which means it's continuously running in the background. And if you do a bulk index at the same time, there is a potential um, of a conflict error, depending on how you configure your, your bulk index or if you use a update instead of an index operation here. Um, yeah. It's my understanding that, actually, that a lot of, is delete by query, that's one of those queries that runs in the background because most APIs won't return until they are complete typically. But then there are some that do that, so yeah. Yeah, if you want to basically run delete by query and think there's a dedicated parameter yeah. um, to make sure it only returns once it's finished, but that comes with its own set of problems because this means your HTTP connection will be open for potentially a long time. And you know, you have firewalls in between, uh, you have systems going down, uh, potentially networks going down. So the usual way of this is to create a um, delete by query request, which gets put into the background and you get back a so-called task ID and you can keep querying this task if this task is finished because delete by query is a background task within the Elasticsearch cluster. In this way, you could probably figure out when is my delete by query fin uh, finished and then start the bulk indexing after that. And this should prevent all of those problems with having conflict errors uh, or you're collecting the conflict errors and just keep um, bulk indexing after that. But then you have to be sure that your documents are still there because if you do a bulk index and then the document gets deleted, that probably is a problem. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I'll also say there's a parameter called request underscore timeout specifically that will essentially it hands that timeout to the HTTP client and you can call that parameter on any API. So if that request, for example, just takes longer, you know, and you aren't getting a reply back, uh, the HTTP client will eventually if you don't set it to just never timeout, if you set it to any sort of timeout, eventually it'll give up on that request and say, hey, I'm not getting a response back. Um, so if you want to extend that timeline, uh, you would have to configure request underscore timeout to be some larger value. So if there's like some API, obviously like for search, you probably would want to use async search, or if it's an API that gives you back a task, you can use that. But if there's an API that for whatever reason is taking longer, but doesn't give you a task, which I can't think of one, but if there is one for some reason, or if your network is slow or there's other reasons, 
um, you can use request timeout to extend how long the HTTP client is willing to wait for a response to come back. Thanks a ton to Thess for helping us today and running this talk and answering a ton of questions. Yeah, thanks for all the questions, everybody. Appreciate it. Yeah, and see you next time. Have a good day.